today and also to our guests. I just have to recognize, as all of we do, that we're suddenly living in a very pivotal moment during a tense and dangerous time that won't be the subject of today's forum, but today's forum will look back at a time uh, which was similarly extremely dangerous and hugely destructive. The question arises all the time for those of us who follow developments in Germany, how have people in Germany looked back over the decades on the events that took place during Nazi reign in Germany during World War II? And in particular, how has the Holocaust been remembered or disremembered, uh, recalled or forgotten, faithfully transcribed or the opposite. It's a complicated question. It changes over time. And it also changes depending on what region of Germany and what populations within Germany one is looking at. Anyone who goes back and forth to Germany or just reads about the country knows that the country has changed and continues to change significantly. And our guests today are going to talk about certain innovations in Holocaust education in this uh, constantly changing country. Um, we have three wonderful speakers who will present the program collectively. One is Ted Stunke, and I have the privilege of serving on a committee that Ted heads up at the Holocaust Museum on Holocaust denial, distortion, and anti-Semitism. He's in charge of the museum's educational outreach internationally and recently has returned from visits to both Cairo and Abu Dhabi, where developments are underway about newly instituting some programs on Holocaust education. Elisa Fishman and I date back a long time at the Holocaust Museum, some 30 years. She's a historian there, and she works very actively in the Division of International Educational Outreach. And I was reminiscing a bit ago with Klaus Müller. He and I traced back together also over many years to the Netherlands. He's now will be speaking to us from Berlin. He's played an active role in deliberations about the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism and numerous other important matters. Uh, I'm now going to hand over Tad to you and we can begin our program proper. Thank you, thank you so much. Alvin and Gunter and Indiana University for inviting us to make this presentation today. And I very much want to thank, in addition to my colleagues, Elisa and Klaus, also Katie Doyle, um, who's our uh, uh, program associate, uh, who's been helping us with the presentation and will be helping us with the PowerPoint today. So thank you, Katie. Um, and also, Thank you, Alvin, for acknowledging uh, the situation that we're, right, we're in uh, today, which is indeed a very disturbing one. I'll just point folks to the fact that our museum issued a statement the other day condemning uh, this unprovoked attack and in particular the misappropriation of Holocaust history through the claim that somehow um, democratic Ukraine needed to be denazified. So, would refer everyone to that if they're interested. And my colleagues and I certainly hope that what we're gonna talk about today is not irrelevant um, to, the broader, uh, to the broader situation in which we're uh, living at the moment. And to begin our presentation, we're going to start with a short uh, video. Some were neighbors. What made ordinary people become complicit in the Holocaust? 
how were the top figures of the Nazi regime able to rely on an army of nameless faces that made the deadly persecution of Jewish people in Germany and Europe possible in the first place? When neighbors looked on but did nothing, tolerating silently and supporting the unfathomable. The exhibition of the same name from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum investigates these questions. The first stop of the exhibition's tour is the German Bundestag. In the Paul Löbe building, Bundestag President Wolfgang Schäuble had words of warning at the opening of the exhibition. Most Germans, if they had been asked in 1945, would probably have described themselves as decent. There hardly was an awareness of their personal responsibility for what happened, and even less so, an expression of remorse. Many Germans at the time were able to self their conscience by pinning the blame for war and genocide for the total political, economic and moral collapse of their country solely on the National Socialist leaders. The exhibition was opened on the same day as the ceremony of remembrance for the victims of National Socialism at the German Bundestag. As guest speaker, the historian and Holocaust survivor Saul Friedländer appealed for us not to close our eyes to a resurgence of anti-Semitism in the world. Germany, he said, has a special role to play in this respect. Because, like many people, I see in Germany today a thoroughly different Germany. Thanks to its lengthy transformation since the war, Germany has become one of the strong bulwarks against the dangers I just mentioned. We all hope that you will have the moral steadfastness to continue fighting for tolerance and inclusiveness, humanity and freedom, in short, for true democracy. Showing courage and not remaining passive, the exhibition, Somewhere Neighbors, examines what made the Holocaust possible. The themes of humiliation and persecution are on display in scenes of everyday brutality observed by many. The fact that the exhibition tour starts at the Bundestag has a great symbolic value for the director of the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, the German Bundestag is, is not only a place of immense prestige, it's a symbol, and it's a symbol of renewal and resilience and the rebirth of democracy but also the fragility of democracy. So to start our exhibition here in this place, it's an important statement that Germany as a nation is making about its responsibility for the past, but I think also about Germany's responsibility for the future. The creators of the exhibition hope that young people in particular will be made aware of the dangers of anti-Semitism. Many of these terrible things were not just ordered from the top. A lot of people were actively involved in them, although they could have resisted. I think that's important, looking at precisely that, and saying it wasn't these Nazi elites and we're only going to look at who was at the top of the chain and who gave the orders, but instead taking a close look at society, what happened between neighbors. Further information can be found online at bundestag.de forward slash en slash visit the Bundestag. So our presentation today is not only about how this exhibition came to Germany, but also and more importantly, how we're working together with German partners to develop educational models related to the exhibit's themes and questions, uh, which you saw here in the video. Who was responsible? How did ordinary people react? And what can this history tell us about the role of ordinary people today, especially in the face of intensifying anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred? But to talk about how it got to Germany, we need to take a step back. And here's a photo of the parent exhibition on display in our museum from 2013 to 2017. Why did we create this 
exhibition in the first place. It addressed one of the central questions about the Holocaust. How is it possible? And American teachers were telling us that one of their challenges was to move their students beyond the idea that the Holocaust was all the result of Hitler and a small group of Nazi leaders. So the exhibit told stories from among the countless others who helped make the genocide possible. Those ordinary people who participated and were benefited from it, as well as people who chose to resist and whose actions saved lives. So it's really about choices and the choices that everyday people made. Well, why did we create a version for Europe? Um, first was the positive reaction of many German friends when they saw it in our museum. I remember in particular, there was a large group of representatives of German organizations combating anti-Semitism and other forms of intolerance. And many were surprised, even shocked at what they saw as a different approach to telling Holocaust history, the focus on stories of individuals, stories of ordinary people, descriptions of the pressures and motivations that shaped those people's behavior at the time. And many of our colleagues felt that this presentation made the history accessible in ways that were different from what they were used to. Some I remember were even in tears saying that I wish I could have taken my grandparents through it before they died to ask them you know, what it was like at the time. So we had some encouragement from our German friends. That was the first thing. But there was something else that was motivating us. And at the time, we, among many others, were observing a disturbing trend in Holocaust memory, an increase in the distortion of Holocaust history in the lands where it happened, and the re-energizing of simplistic and nationalistic narratives about who was responsible. And you can see here that the museum did a study on this topic, which we entitled Holocaust Memory at Risk, and which you can find on our website if you're interested. But from an educational standpoint, we thought that the Summer Neighbors exhibit, presenting as it did examples from across Europe about the various ways in which ordinary people responded, could be a good educational tool to complicate these simplistic distorted narratives. And to give you just one example specific to Germany, many educators told us that they're dealing with the fact that today, uh, a high percentage of Germans perceive their families as victims of national socialism. And these educators are also dealing with a surge in anti-Semitism. And my colleagues will elaborate on both of these topics more. But as a general point, since this is a series about anti-Semitism, we know that Holocaust denial and distortion often promote virulent anti-Semitic stereotypes and conspiracy theories. And we also know that distorting the history can be an effort to whitewash anti-Semitism out of the history of pre-war European society. So what did we do? We took that big exhibition and we created a set of 23 posters. And I think that uh, people uh, in the invite were uh, given a link where you can go to the United Nations website. Uh, we created these posters with the UN information uh, centers and also UNESCO. And here you see the uh, poster exhibit also on display at the UN headquarters in 2019. And we've translated this poster set into at least eight or nine languages and which you can access also on our, on our website, but the English version is at the, at the UN site. So this is uh, an effort of ours with the exhibit that's not only limited to Germany, um, but of course, Germany is what we're gonna talk about today. So in order to do that, and without further ado, uh, to talk about more specifically what we've done with our German partners and how it's been received, I'm gonna turn the floor over to my colleague, uh, Klaus Mueller. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ted. Um, and as you already outlined, Summer Neighbors started at the German Parliament in January 2019. And since then, we have shown the exhibit in uh, many different locations. We also offered educational programs for facilitators and students um, in different German states. And I show you some location pictures uh, while I describe these partnerships. Here you see a photo still from the German Parliament is one of the videos that we show um, and display in the exhibition. From Berlin, we went to the East German state of Saxony-Anhalt, working together with the NGO Miteinander at the University of Halle, which you see here, the Gardelegen City Library and the State Parliament in Magdeburg. Here you see the opening. In West German, Northern Westphalia, we showed Summer neighbors in close cooperation with the memorial Villa Ten Homfel in Münster. Um, and then at nearly 20 locations here, you see the foyer of Münster district government where the exhibition was shown. Um, and here you see Recklinghausen. So there are a great number of different locations. We went from Northern Westphalia to Rhineland Palatinate, uh, where we showed the exhibit in cooperation with Osthof Memorial at four locations. Here you see the NS Documentation Center uh, and Memorial in Osthofen. And uh, here you also really see the next state we went to, uh, Thuringia, where we showed uh, quite recently the exhibition at the State Parliament in Erfurt, and we also show it at the city of Eisenach. We also showed uh, then um, the exhibition in different memorial sites across Germany, Neuengamme, close to Hamburg, which you see here, the House of the Wannsee Conference in Berlin, where we showed it outside, both in English and in German for the international visitors. Uh, you see the opening here. We showed it at Prora, at the German Baltic Sea up in the north, and uh, in the German Criminal Police Office in Wiesbaden, as well as, which you see here, as well as in the Bayreuth City Library. For 2022, we prepare uh, more partnerships in Saxony and Hesse, including with the city of Leipzig, the Dresden Hygiene Museum, the Pirna Memorial, and the city of Kassel. And here you see the overview of Germany and the different German states we have been in so far. So why did we focus on German states as, as you understand from the map? Um, Culture, memorial culture, school education, university education fall under the author authority of the respective German states. So networking within the respective states was crucial for us and the political support of state governments, ministries of cultures and anti-Semitism uh, commissioners was very helpful. As you see, we deliberately also did choose diverse partners, cities mediated through the German City Association NGOs working on contemporary right-wing extremism and anti-Semitism, memorials, libraries, universities, as well as state parliaments and the German police headquarters, in order to gain experience how German audiences approach the exhibit and its key question, how was the Holocaust possible? Showing the exhibition in, just, in such different locations was only possible thanks to strong partnerships with German institutions which know the audience on the ground and are able to mediate exhibition goals with local governments, cities, schools, local historians, or and civil rights groups. So cooperation is intense. We jointly explore opportunities, outreach opportunities. We learn together. We didn't plan to show the exhibit in so many locations over such a long period of time. It was the reactions, the exhibition, received that opened up new partnerships, larger opportunities, and um, also enabled a new set of questions, reactions from our German colleagues, but also from visitors we toured. And I remember vividly a tour of a civil rights group um, that I did in, at the Halle University. The group struggles and came uh, explaining it to prevent their neighborhood in the center, center of the city being taken over by right-wing extremism today. Anchored in a housing project by an extremist group, using intimidation tactics to silence that neighborhood. 
when they came, they thought about summer neighbors as being about history. When they left, they had discussed so many connections uh, to the exhibition and their current life and work that they said the questions also concern us right now as we struggle as neighbors against right-wing extremism right now in Halle and also the attitudes we see. So they really benefited from um, working with the exhibition. What we also have seen that many of our partners um, have localized the exhibit by accompanying programs. Some were neighbors, thus became some were our neighbors. Additional local documents and photos make the persecution of Jews and Roma and Sinti in front of now familiar house facades more visible. And the local perspective helps visitors to understand that events took place in an everyday setting in their neighborhood and that ordinary people contribute to it. Visitors discuss their local, regional, and also family history. Many express deep concern about growing anti-Semitism in Germany, both in word and attacks, the radicalization of extreme right groups and the multiplication of Holocaust distortion through social media, fueled as in many other countries as well by Corona conspiracy theories. Working with partners within state parameters enabled us to gain a better understanding of complex pedagogical challenges at hand. But it was also equally productive to have conversations with our partners across state borders, which we did in a number of online workshops. And what we learned from these workshops is that many of the participants see themselves at this point in a necessary and urgent need um, to, th to think about their pedagogical work. They ask themselves, how can we rethink Holocaust education in schools, universities, adult education, also in view of rising antisemitism in their communities? And the central question was whether the role and responsibility of German society is sufficient, sufficiently addressed in Holocaust education in Germany, or whether it could be communicated better. With our German partners, we are working on pedagogical approaches to address the questions of a younger generation. A generation that initially knows less due to the distance in time, but is the Holocaust also emotionally distant for young people? We did not see that in our work with young people. So how do families and schools talk about national socialism and antisemitism? How is the effect, um, how is this affected by the generation of survivors leaving us? Many students do not have a German family background. Some struggle with their own experiences of persecution and flight. So how can we bring the relevance of Holocaust education to a diverse generation? Over the last years, and we benefited from that while working on that exhibition, um, empirical research has helped us to better understand German approaches to the Holocaust. We work with the MEMO studies team in, uh, of Bielefeld University, which conducts since 2018 surveys on what Germans know about the Holocaust, how they remember, and how they connect. Their empirical data help to reflect if and how the involvement of German society in Nazi crimes is addressed in Holocaust education and what challenges might arise asking this question. A 2022 survey just published by the commission and commissioned by Owls and Archives, focusing on 16 to 25 year olds, attitudes to the history of the Nazi era also offers important data for us to do this work, including on German youth with a migrant background and maybe just two points uh, there is a high level of interest in Nazi history among 16 to 25 year olds. It's even higher than in the comparison group of 40 to 60 year olds. And this generation sees a strong connection between Nazi history and current challenges. Being sensitive to uh, issues such as racism, exclusion and bullying, 48% see connections between current political development and Nazi history. 
And young people with a migration background see even stronger parallels when it comes to bullying and everyday racism. However, one result also was that the term anti-Semitism seems to be perceived by 16 to 25 year olds as a somehow specialist term and is rarely used in their everyday language. So in our partnership with German institutions, we focus, as Ted already said, on, on new pedagogical approaches to the exhibition. How can we strengthen engagement with regional, local, and family perspectives? How can we use a participatory learning approach to help visitors explore the exhibition and ask their own questions about it? And I turn to my colleague, Elisa Fishman, who will talk more about what that means. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Klaus showed you that we have worked extensively and intensively in Germany with partners. And after a year and a half of working with individual venues, we decided to bring our partners together for an online meeting to learn more about how this work was valuable for them. We learned the topic of Summer Neighbors is relevant. Our partners liked that Summer Neighbors focused on individual personal lives. They liked the title, the crimes of national socialism concerned neighborhoods and how they reacted during that time. And they felt the exhibit and topic was approachable for students and prompted discussion. Our partners also tell us that doing education around the exhibition is a great way for them to engage their audiences on a very timely topic, given the rise in anti-Semitic violence the neo-Nazi movements and assaults on Holocaust memory. In fact, the exhibition and their work with us allows them to build new relationships. We also learned that venues wanted to talk with others who were working with the program. As Klaus mentioned, what they had done in their city, what worked, where they ran into problems. So we brought them together, prior venues and upcoming venues for workshops. They found this cross-state sharing both productive and helpful since they rarely have a chance to talk this way across states or even have time to reflect on their own pedagogical methods. So this feedback from our partners led us to the idea of a hub, where a few venues in a region join together and or with a regional organization like a Center for Political Education, a Landa Centrala, or a Ministry of Education. They come together to work, to continue to work with the Summer Neighbors Program and to explore additional ways of engagement. So what is the educational program that we developed with our partners, our, so to speak, educational model? As my colleague said, this project is not a traditional traveling exhibition, but rather a collaboration with German partners on education. The topic is the choices ordinary people made during the Holocaust, and the exhibit looks at experiences across Europe, not just Germany or Poland or Hungary, and shows that people made similar types of choices in each country. Around this topic, we've developed activities and models in collaboration with our German partners that respond to local needs and help our target audience understand that it wasn't just Hitler and a few leaders who were responsible. We are learning with our partners how to engage emerging adults aged 14 to 25 in this topic. So this highly interactive, discussion-based educational program facilitates understanding by drawing on student perspectives, insights, and thoughts to drive the learning process. As you can see here, this is a group in Munster working with a facilitator. So the participants build their understanding of the historical material gradually, following their own questions, their own interests, through the historical material and responding to the facilitator's prompts. As they develop into a community of learners, the group explores both how this past can be understood and how it is relevant today. This educational structure combines and entwines learning about the subject with the experience of actively taking part in joint meaning making with other participants. Again, this is what you can see in this photo. So what are the specific components of the educational program? First, obviously we have the exhibit itself, which you can see here in this, uh, this image. A second component of the program is what we call multiplier meetings. 
uh, or trainings, multiplier meetings or trainings for facilitators. And you can see that happening here. We hold trainings for facilitators at venues to lay out our educational program. Facilitators are able to experience the program as the students would, and thus work through any issues they might have around how they would engage students. They get to practice and explore how the program works, how it differs from what they might be used to. The bulk of the program is four activities that we developed, again, in collaboration with our partner venues in Germany. And these four are a historical film activity, a photo analysis, a student-led workshop, and a local tour. So let me talk about each one. So the first one is this historical film activity. And this activity focuses on what we call the Bronya and Gerhard historical footage, which shows adults and children participating in the public shaming of a teenage couple for having a German-Polish relationship. And you can see in this slide here, this is Bronya on the right and Gerhard on the left. And this is uh, in German because it's being shown in Germany. So the process of viewing and discussing this footage encourages the group to assess the behavior and action in the film within its historical context. So you can see here again, students in Munster watching the film. So the students, as they discuss this footage and examine and explore what is happening in it, begin to consider the idea that some townspeople who, although they're not actively participating in the humiliation, were not in fact passive onlookers, but rather were an integral part of a very public coordinated spectacle. Again, coming back to the theme of the exhibition, the role of ordinary people in the Holocaust. So the second uh, uh, activity is a photo analysis. When examining a photo in this activity, we ask students to consider the perspective of the photographer to infer something about their perspective and worldview. By differentiating our own position from that of the photographer, we may, be more, we may be more able to reflect critically on each position, that of the photographer and our own. For example, we ask not what are we looking at, but rather what did the photographer see and why did this matter enough to trigger the camera's shutter? Why record this moment framed in just this way? Participants thus learn to see photographic images as a source of information to be examined critically and to consider multiple elements of the photo, not just what is at the center of the image, but to look at the periphery and others watching the action, for example. And you can see here in this slide, the image on the left is the poster, actually one of the posters from the exhibit, and the focus of the, uh, of the photograph is the bottom half of this image. But then we also begin to wonder, well, what's going on with the people up above looking out the window? What are they thinking? What, what are, how, how are they understanding what's happening? Okay, so that was the second one, photo analysis. The next one is a workshop led by participants. So using the framework of inquiry-based learning, this workshop activity engages visitors in facilitated conversations in which their interests and questions drive the discussion. So we ask students to explore the exhibit on their own and select a few elements that they are drawn to. Then the group comes back together to focus on and dive deeper into those elements. Students thus experience agency in directing their own learning. It is a participant-centered focus. And the final one that I'll talk about is the fourth activity, a local tour of sites of historic relevance. So we bring the past closer to home for the students by exploring the local history of the town that is hosting the exhibition. In visiting local streets and places in the vicinity of the venue, participants uncover and discover events that occurred in their own town or village, even while contemporary public life bustles around them. And you can see that happening here in Munster. These are some students with a guide. This activity is one of the most popular and engaging for participants. So where are we right now in terms of this project? We are currently in the middle of the project. We are enhancing our existing regional hubs that I spoke about earlier with our regional partners at the Lunda Centrala and Ministries of Education. And you might ask, why are these two organizations in particular interested in developing a hub? So they are by and large responsible for remembrance work in their regions, along with some others, but this is one of their responsibilities. And they have said that some were neighbors and the local connections that venues have made are helpful for those efforts. 
It's clear to them that the exhibition has been very well received and has had an impact. These regional entities are facilitators and they see that they have a productive role in continuing this work in their region. For example, the Minister of Education in Rhineland-Palatinate said when she spoke at the opening of Some Were Neighbors in her state, quote, what I wish for this exhibition is that the many questions that are presented here stimulate further thought and research, that it leads to a deeper examination of the spectrum of human possibilities for action and to an exchange about how valuable a free democratic state and social order is. So what are our interim educational conclusions? We have learned that students who participated in the exhibition workshop largely do so very attentively. Students like the approach the facilitators take to conveying knowledge and leading them through the exhibition. They agree that, that students themselves agree that they were able to contribute their own ideas and thoughts in the context of the exhibition tour. In addition, students like that they were not expected to reproduce a specific body of knowledge, as is often the case in school. And the regionality of the photographs created a special emotional connection between the visitors and the events. One student noted that, quote, you cannot imagine that in the place you know or even live, such things happened, and that it was not that long ago. So what's next? As I said, we are currently in the middle of this project. We are working to facilitate several more hubs, the creation of several more hubs, and to build a network of people using somewhere neighbors and who want to continue to do so. There are indications that this work will continue after, even after we leave, we the museum leave. So I want to call your attention um, to some links for further information. I know Gunter sent this out earlier, but here they are again on the screen. Uh, so the first one is to the poster sets in nine languages that are available on our website for download. There's also well, the second link here is information on our site in German about the project. So this is mostly for our audience in Germany, but those of you who speak, read German, uh, obviously welcome to look at that. And then the last one is again, the link for the UN's exhibition page where you can see the exhibit in English. So thank you for your attention and we look forward to your questions. <laughs>